As soon as videotape left the factory, it already started to break down. Information that is on the tapes is slowly dying, and if we don't preserve them, important historical content that's contained on them will be lost forever. What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? MePOPS stands for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound. What MePOPS does for the general public of the Pacific Northwest is provide access to digitized content. Our mission is to raise awareness about the magnetic media crisis, the alarm that the Association of Moving Image Archivists sounded to sort of bring awareness to the urgency of digitizing videotape. Audiovisual Archive in Australia has put a deadline of 2025 to say if you don't have your magnetic material digitized by this time, you're, you're screwed. They're figuring out the actual date and it's right around the corner. Within 20 to 30 years of the time it's created, it's, it's disintegrating. The magnetic media crisis is sometimes called a gathering storm because the deterioration of the actual analog videotapes and then the increasing obsolescence and rarity of the players that play them back. So video is a little bit different from film in that video went through all these different iterations, all these different formats for consumer purposes, for broadcast purposes, whereas film, there were consumer formats, 616 millimeter, 8, 8 millimeter, but the principle of film has stayed pretty consistent and video requires all these different players. A lot of the formats that we work with stopped being manufactured years ago. And so we have to make sure that we take good care of them and tune them up, clean them, because a lot of the parts and players are getting harder and harder to come by, and so are the people who actually work on them. They're a dying breed, if you will. In some cases, people thought they were creating preservation copies by putting um, film onto videotape. In fact, that was that was not a great a great a great idea. Film is actually quite stable. The thing about older media types like film and negatives is that they are stable. Thirty years from now, you're going to be able to view them. Hundred-year-old nitrate film, in some cases, is still around and looks gorgeous. Rosie Video, for its manufacture, had a completely different different purpose. It was more of a kind of uh, democratizing um, format for shooting. It was a lot cheaper than film, so not only were professionals using it, but also amateurs and just the average person was able to buy videotape and record. There was plenty of access. You could watch your, your VHS tape of a film, but now that VHS tape needs a lot of help. We have to keep up. We can't just sort of settle back and say, okay, we're finished. Despite the fact that we're working with old materials that have their fixed content, the way we view that material, the way we store that material is going to just keep changing and evolving. A lot of the time, videotape is capturing real people doing real things. That might sound personal and boring, but it really encompasses so much of Seattle and Seattle's history that it's valuable to the general public and great for them to be able to access it. The public is able to see files digitized at MePOPS on Internet Archive where we create collections for each group so that they can, based on that institution, go in and view the content on their personal computer. Hi, I'm Paul Seipel, the communications manager and audiovisual technician for MePOPS. Full disclosure, I'm just going to read this from a script because even alone in my basement in a room by myself in front of my computer, I'm totally capable of getting stage fright. The intro to MePOPS that we play before each program conveys the urgency of the magnetic media crisis and gives you a sense of what kinds of recordings we stand to lose if we don't act quickly. As somebody who's very new to archival work, however, I'm not able to add too much to that yet, so I'm focusing on what I know. In my free time, I make video art. 
mostly using technology scavenged from the decades that produced a lot of the videotape that archivists are now racing to preserve in 2020. Since tapes and cameras were mass-produced and later deemed obsolete in such incredible quantities, they are easy to find secondhand. This video is just going to be a quick exploration of how video feedback loops are created and how you can use them in artistic practice using examples from my own experiments. Many of the amateur filmmakers that were created by the great democratizing boom of camcorder availability in the 80s and 90s were content simply to tape family functions. We value those home movies for their unvarnished perspective and personal histories. But today's program is a reminder that, while birthdays and weddings were being more rigorously recorded than ever before, the same tools were being applied by early adopters, basement experimentalists, and practicing artists a new visual language was being developed. Before I was even born, countless consumers discovered video art in their living rooms. It's difficult not to. The simple act of pointing a video camera towards a television screen that's displaying what that camera is seeing produces video feedback. A camera being fed its own video output signal in a closed loop produces a strobing or cascading visual effect. The effect responds dramatically to where a camera is placed and at what angle. This phenomenon is very easy to stumble on by accident, and for anyone curious enough to ask them, it immediately brings up a lot of questions. How do you control this vortex? Can you change its direction or speed? What happens when you increase your distance from the TV or change the camera's focus? From each question that you answer, a new one will arise. Before long, you're trying different combinations of monitors and cameras, introducing light from other sources to your experiment, drooling over 35-year-old monitors on eBay, promising your housemates that the cardboard over the windows is only temporary, and lying on the floor in a pile of composite video cables, pondering the true meaning of infinity. Video feedback is hypnotic, simple, and intuitive, and its creative possibilities are endless. In these videos, every configuration of cameras and monitors is just a simple daisy chain of connections. Cables carry the output from one device to the input of another. They occasionally mix two or more outputs together, or use a splitter to be able to use the same signal multiple times. Two cameras viewing the same feedback loop from different angles can be combined using a video mixer. Their differing perspectives can be emphasized using digital effects each camera might have. Mosaic, sepia tone, or posterize effects are all common camcorder features. Others might have a mirroring effect. One camera might be in focus and another out of focus. If you're really feeling the exploratory rush, you might try projecting something onto a textured surface or an object. Throwing more light into a feedback system is a sure shortcut to psychedelic results. Party lights, your phone flashlight, a laser pointer, or another projector if you have one handy. In this video, a loop of distressed 16mm leader shares the spotlight. But you don't necessarily need more technology to make more interesting images. Waving household objects between the camera and monitor can create interesting disruptions. Mirrors, tinfoil, a magnifying glass, cellophane, a tennis racket, sunglasses, or in this instance, a textured glass cutting board, all materials are valid in video art. Finally, combine your work with whatever else your heart desires. Feedback is bright, visually versatile, and often rhythmic, so it lends itself to decorative and collaborative art. Use it to create atmosphere for events, backgrounds for music videos, outdoor installation art, or use it to add visual intensity to a dance or theater performance. While the clips in this video use a great deal of feedback, it's not really an essential component of experimental video. You can mix anything in video projects. Sculptural elements, pre-recorded video, animation, actors, found footage, machines. Video art is a sprawling sandbox that both invites and rewards a process of DIY innovation in a cycle of positive feedback. This program of shorts offers a further dive into the myriad combinations that are possible as you experiment with moving images. These clips are saturated with that satisfying, antsy feeling that you get when you see something that you want to try yourself. And I hope that the second it ends, that that's exactly what you do.
Seattle approach, West Des Moines 895, Bravo 3.5. Now you're broken, but I'm at 3.5, about three miles uh, south of Harvey. Uh, 3.5 will work fine, thank you. Yeah, I just keep laying down low, get me safe.
Eggs and soup. Three, two, one. Curled on the couch, wrapped in a warm boredom, I wait and watch, crunching a cough drop like candy. From a shadow shaped like a crib grows a whimper. Jesse's crying again. Electrical nursery tones, lullaby from the bars, till her seedling moan bends to the drone and weakens back into breaths. Slippery headlight shards slide in slow strokes, exposing a barrage of proud pictures. Battered plants, holes punched in the walls, a green lamp that shivers, cold toys down the hall, and a doll, alone in a chair, or cub like oily lips sipped soup and eggs for dinner. Jessie's crying again. The clock consoles her with sprockets and springs till her simmering head surrenders its weight and exhales back into sleep. Dawn yawns suffusing the dark of these caves with gray air, while lumbering bears, toting car keys and grub, trudge towards work, with eyes closed. The slumbering shore of morning rolls over. Jesse's crying again. The whole 60s thing that happened, which was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. People wanted to see things happen. Don Scott here. He taught at Cornish too, didn't he? Uh, he taught there until he was fired, yeah. Mm -hmm. He put a white dove in the far corner of the theater up so people could be looking at the white dove. And around it, he put a golden frame. And then next to it, he stenciled on the wall the word ecology. And when he was fired, myself and two other students put up the money to give him so he could re-enroll at Cornish as a student so he could continue to teach our class, which he did. There was the rights movements and the war and all that was going on, so there the whole atmosphere was changed. And the feminist movement. Yeah. I have done no training. I have only the urge and the will to succeed. I will now endeavor to Each world record, page by page. A lot of electronic things were coming out, but also just the awareness of uh, there being a universal connection. I mean, uh, things like using a telephone as an art piece uh, tool. Uh, the porta pack, the porta pack was uh, being used. Uh, Postcards were being used. Uh, anything, uh, Xerox machines were being used. I think a lot of us who were doing things like paintings all of a sudden had a second look at whether painting was worth our time or not.
and uh, started using other materials. The air is electronic. Was in response to a request from Ann Folk. Ann was uh, interested in encouraging the television station to make the cameras and the studios and the microphones, the stuff that we work with, available to artists. I sometimes wondered how how do these people get in here? Very I thought essence. everybody's a little crazy. These people are just showing it off more than anybody else I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I can't ever remember doing a project that was really burnt. He was a friend of the project. He was there kind of, I mean, he didn't work at Channel 9, he was more with Ann and Andor and all that, but he was a friend of these people and a friend of these projects sort and encouragement that. for them. I think it does change the whole context of what I was saying. We really weren't very yeah, successful really in that, pushing, uh, like you know, artistic television or video art onto the station. And even taking all of the activity that had gone on for a two-year period of time, there really hadn't been for the station's money anything really achieved. There really hadn't been anything that had happened. There had been a lot of product recorded. No product. I can't tell you, Alan, how many times since then I have defended uh, things that looked uh, unart-like to other people who wanted the art to look like art should look. I've done the dope thing. I've done, I've done the drinking thing, which doesn't seem to stop. And and still, after all these years, and in a number of years, I'm still, I'm really still not sure. Perfect. 
You have responsibilities. You have obligations. If you don't do this right, there are going to be repercussions. And serious repercussions. I don't know how... How can I keep going? It's just... It's so terrifying. I, I know I have to keep going. I know I will keep going. But... I don't know, why does it have to, why does it have to hurt so much? And why do I always have to be so scared? For God's sake, don't chew those fingernails! You're always chewing your fingernails! What's wrong with you? Can't you just stop it? Can't you get a hold of yourself? Get serious now. Are you going to present this in public? I mean, you really need to think about this.
Tell me the story. What story? You know, the one about the great tree and its rings of memory and power. I know the story you mean, Stevie, huh? All right, I'll tell it. One day, many years ago, there was a great man loved by all who really knew him. He was on a quest, sent into the dark forest by the gods, alone, with only what he could carry on his broad, strong back. It was winter. November? Yes. And it began to snow. And this man walked deeper and deeper into the darkening woods, until in any direction he looked, he could see no light from the edge of the forest whence he'd come. At first, he was comforted by the voices of birds <laughs> and the presence of animals he could feel all around him. But as he walked on deeper into the woods, through the accumulating snow, ducking beneath branches that seemed to swing out at him, he also walked through a silence never before imagined, as if a great cunning beast had in one long inhale sucked up all sound and spirit from the heart of the forest. <laughs> he tried to sing, but no sound emerged from lips that no longer moved. <coughs> Loneliness engulfed him. He could feel life flowing from his body like water from a pail. <laughs> and then, looking up, I saw the tallest, I was tall, most massive tree I'd ever seen. And I knew at once the gods had sent me here to find you. I wielded my axe against this oldest of living beings. For six days and six nights, I cut and hacked and chopped and chopped and cut and hacked and chopped. story, if I die, then, then you die. 
right? If you die, then I die. Right? You're much too poetic, my little friend. Listen, I'll tell you a secret. In the story, if I die, you would be just fine. But enough of this. We will not tell the story again, Stevie. It's, it's much too hard on you. We can tell the story again. <laughs> I love the story. We can do it again. I'm not tired. I am, Stevie. And if I'm tired, then you must be too. <laughs> Who am I? Get some sleep, Stevie. Stevie, give me your hand. Nobody, Steve. You're mine. I take care of you. You know I love you, don't you, Stevie? Do you love me? Do I have to? <laughs> yes. Is it important to you? Ye yes, yes. My name is Doris Chase. For many years I worked as a painter and a sculptor, and now I find most of my work is done in film and video. It's almost as if my work has come full circle, returning again to painting, returning this time with emotional approach, with the ability to change. My work in wood, it has to do with very basic forms, very basic shapes that seem to wish themselves in and out of one another. And then the excitement of transferring some of the small models into the large scale, into the scale where, wherein you can be part of the form. And the, and the feel of wood when you're working with it.
to accomplish large pieces uh, like I was doing at one time, it would take maybe uh, two tons of wood that are laminated and uh, a number of people helping me with the sewing and then always the finishing work. The finishing work goes for months and months. In all the work, when one is uh, about to accomplish a large piece, it starts first with very small scale and then goes slowly over many periods of uh, questioning into the larger scale. And, and the large scale pieces maybe first would be accomplished in wood and then, and then would go into steel. people working with me and for me, they become creators along with me on these projects. And in steel, when a piece maybe gets to be three or four tons, it takes a number of people to put it together. For instance, uh, the one in Seattle, the top section of it is uh, kinetic in that it moves and revolves around the, the lower section. the choreographer Mary Staten called me. She'd seen an article about my work and some photographs and wondered if I'd be interested in working with her on a production for the Seattle Opera Company. some of the work that was there, models of it, uh, how it would work for her, how I felt it would work. And, and uh, through these discussions, often we evolved forms that, that were possible. Now, as the scale increased in the works for theater, I also had to change materials because uh, the material that would be uh, used for exterior work would never work for dancers. So much of this uh, work in theater is in fiberglass and different types of laminated woods that will withstand the, the weight of a dancer's body and uh, also uh, be light enough to be transportable. like to work with the choreographer to a degree in suggesting how the forms might work, might form as, as an aesthetic uh, whole or sculpture. And then, of course, I leave them to their, their own devices. the Central Notion group, many groups, uh, Mary State and dancers in various parts of the country. And it's very exciting for me to see them come to different conclusions with the very same form.
from the poems with Dan, I got the impression from the audiences, from the teachers and the children, that, that they felt I should design or try to design forms for children. And so I uh, evolved a, a group of forms that nest together and, and work as learning teaching tools for children. I could capture some of the exciting moments that happened in theater with dance and with children was through the medium of film. And so I find myself now working more and more in film and also in video because I also can control the form and the color. I create the form in the beginning and then they transcend it with their motion and their change. And then, of course, I have to have the last word in putting it on, on tape and film.
Back to normal. Where are we? Where are, we are we on? Yeah. Yes. Right, what? Does my voice sound tinny? No. Oh, no. No. You're right. You're okay.
Be corny.